When you hear a melody, you're not just hearing the notes one by one unconnected to each other. There's something more than that. And you could even argue that it doesn't matter that much what specific sounds you hear. For example, you could listen to the same melody played on the piano or the guitar or just played one octave higher. And at the end of the day, your takeaway of that melody would be pretty similar. That's the background of something called Gestalt or Gestalt theory, which basically says that the whole of something is more important than its individual elements. And it's got some really interesting visual examples to try to convince you. Now, not all of them are gonna apply directly to photography, but the ones that do, I think that there's a lot to be learned from them. And at least at a personal level, I know that my composition skills directly improved as a result of what I'm about to show you. So let's just jump in. The most famous example of Gestalt theory is called the law of closure. And basically it looks like this. That's obviously not an actual circle, it's just a bunch of unconnected segments that are kind of close to each other. But looking at it, I mean that is a circle. We see patterns all the time that aren't complete, but we just fill in the gaps. We know that they're grouped together as one object. And this applies to the concept of shapes in photography. And shapes have two big roles to play. First, they can be just an object in the photo. When you have a noticeable shape in your image, it draws attention. That's true of the circular shapes in this photo, because each one of them adds some interest to the photo and makes that picture worth taking in the first place. The alternative is that shapes can be a structure. In other words, they can form the basis of your composition itself. And when you do have a structure to your composition, it makes that photo feel more intentional and just more grounded. Here's an example of that. And sure, the sun here is a very obvious circle, but that's not what I'm referring to. Instead, I mean that the composition of this photo is structured around a circle. And all right, it is kind of lumpy, but because our brains are good at seeing patterns and filling in the gaps, we can still see it as a circle. And the same thing is true about our brains filling in the gaps when we're talking about that previous photo. Because most of these are not actually great circles. But it doesn't matter because that's still how we see them and they attract a similar amount of attention. This is what Gestalt theory is trying to say, at least for the law of closure. So you can go out there, look for patterns and shapes, and they don't have to be perfect. Our perception is going to fill in the gaps and you'll get a very similar impact anyway. Now of course, the more obvious that the shape is, the stronger all of these characteristics are going to be. But the key here is that even those partial shapes and patterns are still really good at grabbing the eye or just giving structure to your photo. So look for them in the field and you will see that your compositions improve. Next up, another case where Gestalt theory plays a big role is called the law of similarity. And this says that we group together objects and think of them as something more when they're similar to each other in some way. This could just be a similar color or brightness or even their shape and we're still gonna group them together. The classic example looks like this, where we immediately, without even thinking about it, consider the red dots and the blue dots to be separate groups. In photography, this means that groups of similar objects can appear as a singular subject, like the four birds in this photo. Most people probably don't see this as four subjects of equal importance. Instead, it's more like one subject, the flock of birds, which is just comprised of four elements. And that one is a pretty obvious example, but this next photo goes a little bit more to the point that I'm trying to get at. The subject here is the group of white trees. There's well over a dozen trees that go across the entire width of the photo and most of the photo's height, and yet that doesn't stop us from seeing them as basically one subject, or at least as one pattern. And that is what ties this composition together. It's kind of like the structure concept that I was talking about a minute ago, the clear pattern here is what gives this photo a reason to exist and just makes it feel intentional. Now, the most important takeaway from the law of similarity does have to do with tying your photos together, but it doesn't need to be an obvious pattern like that. Instead, any similarities throughout a photo can help tie it together. One example is if the foreground, background, and the sky each have a similar color that shows up. When that kind of thing happens, it's gonna help unify your message and make the photo look stronger because it means that we're perceptually grouping together those different parts of the photo. You can see that really clearly in these two photos here. Now, overall, they're actually pretty similar photos, but there's two differences that make the second picture much better. The first difference is just that the block of ice is more interesting in the second photo. It's got a more unusual shape with some interesting patterns on it 
that I think draw the eye a lot more. But the bigger difference, and the one that relates to the law of similarity, is the light, and more specifically, how well the light works with the subject. In this first photo, we've got what you would consider traditionally good light, but the really nice pastel colors in the sky don't match with the dark gray colors in the ocean or the relatively harsh nature of the subject. And it's also not helped by the gigantic line here that just splits the entire composition. Now, the second photo by comparison has the metallic blue color in the foreground, the ocean, and the sky. The sky and the ocean also look really intense, almost like there's a storm approaching, which is very similar to the message conveyed by this subject. It's a pretty intense foreground. So it should be immediately clear that this second photo feels more cohesive. Here's another example, just one photo this time. Take a look at the foreground and the background here. The fallen tree in the foreground is this very nice brownish gold color surrounded by a lot of areas of blue and it leads you into a background with a golden colored subject and lots of blue in the sky. That similarity brings the photo together. You can tell that I didn't just pick some random foreground, but instead I searched around until I found something that matched the background. And that is the real power of the law of similarity. If different parts of your composition have similarities to each other, whether that's tone or shape or whatever it is, we're gonna mentally group those parts of the photo together. And that makes the photo feel more unified, which in turn sends a stronger emotional message. Next up, there's one called the law of common fate. And this one has to do with motion. It says that when anything is moving, especially when it's moving smoothly, we have the perception of the path that it's moving on. Now, the law of common fate is again meant to be a way that we group together objects. For example, if you've got a bunch of people moving in two main directions, we're gonna group them based on which way they're moving. But for photography, I'm more interested in the first part of that definition, which is that we notice the path that they're moving on. When you're composing your photos, that path should be treated as an object of its own. It has weight and it draws attention, even if there's not an actual line in the photo that's visible. This, for example, looks like a pretty natural composition. I left a decent amount of space in front of the bird for it to move into. But when I leave the exact same amount of space behind the bird, it doesn't look quite right. The bird seems like it's about to leave the frame, and that throws off the whole composition of the photo. Something kind of similar is true in this photo as well. To really show what I'm talking about though, let's take a look at a highly abstract variation of this photo. I know that it's a major simplification, but this is basically the underlying composition. And in this form, it seems like the composition is pretty clearly imbalanced to the left. The abstract camel is just overwhelmingly large, and it shifts the weight of the entire photo. But when you actually look at the photo as it was before, it doesn't seem like it's off balance, or at least not nearly as much as the abstract. And this is because that arrow of direction is pointing to the right. It's shifting the balance of the composition. And there's many other examples of this. Personally, I keep it in mind a lot when I'm doing macro photography that I need to leave some room in front of the subject for it to walk into. Now, the final part of Gestalt theory that I'm gonna talk about is called figure ground organization. This is a bit different from the others so far because it's not exactly a way to group objects together. Instead, it's an explanation of what we even consider to be objects in the first place rather than the area around an object. I've talked about this a little bit before. In photography, we just tend to call this positive space and negative space. The biggest way to tell if something is positive space is just if it's surrounded. In all the photos that I've shown so far of the birds, they're pretty clearly the positive space surrounded by the sky, which is negative space. But you can also tell that something is positive space when it's convex. In other words, it's popping out at you. This is a good way to figure out positive and negative space in that photo of the sand that I showed a bit earlier. In some areas of the photo, the sand is closer, and in other areas, it's farther away. The part that's closer and pops out at you is the positive space. Now, Gestalt theory also throws in that symmetrical and smaller objects are usually gonna be perceived as positive space. And I'd like to add that in photography, anything with high contrast or high levels of detail is usually gonna count as well. And the reason why it's important to organize the visual world into positive and negative space, at least for photography, is that they convey different emotions. If your photo has mostly negative space and then one small area of positive space, it's going to appear kind of empty. And this isn't a bad thing, it just conveys a different emotion. Maybe that's loneliness, even peacefulness, and some of that will depend on your subject. But just think about this. 
one lone pine tree in a snowstorm would be a super strong emotional message, and you could really emphasize that with a composition that has a lot of negative space. Now, if your photo has a lot of positive space, it's going to feel more crowded and maybe even chaotic. I like this look a lot of times for cityscape photos because those are the emotions that I'm trying to convey. Most photos aren't going to be as extreme as the examples that I just gave, and that's completely fine. This is just about adding tools to your toolbox. Once you can recognize what counts as positive and negative space, which really is not that hard, you're gonna start looking for them when you take your photos. And then if you do want that extra feeling of isolation or crowdedness for your subject, you can find a way to compose that photo with the perfect balance of positive and negative space. And there you go. This isn't everything in Gestalt theory, but it is the stuff that I think applies the most to photography. But keep in mind that it doesn't immediately make your photos better just to know about these techniques. You've got to go out, put this into practice yourself, and actively think about these things while you're taking pictures. Now, if you've got any questions or comments, let me know below. And if you're not subscribed but you enjoyed this video, you might consider subscribing. So that does it. My name is Spencer Cox, and I'll see you next time. <music>